Identity has always been a part of how we live our lives in America. And it has often been not only a leader on social issues, but in electoral issues. And for me, becoming governor was incredibly important because it was an opportunity to stand in the space that has so often led to either the advance of identity and the advance of a person's actual citizenship or the restriction thereof. And so I wrote in a recent article in um, response to Francis Fukuyama that I love identity politics. They work for me because I have an identity. I have an identity that is grounded in my race, that is grounded in my gender, an identity that is grounded in my regionalism, an identity that is grounded in my religion. And each of these pieces are immutable parts of me or intrinsic parts of me. The immutable characteristics of race are often seen and used as a method of oppression and repression. The conversation about religion has become a very potent one in the United States and around the world. The issues that we see embedded in identity cannot be divorced from our politics. In fact, electoral politics is often a lagging social indicator. We don't get to the electoral piece until long after the social norms and the divorcing of people from their rights has happened based on their identity. And this has been true from the inception of the United States, and I will use the U.S. as a proof point, although I will argue, of course, that this is not endemic to the U.S. We know that the marginalized did not create identity politics. From the very beginning, from the inception of the United States Constitution, there was a three-fifths compromise. The decision that blacks only constituted three-fifths of humans and therefore were eligible to be treated as chattel. That was an identity foisted upon blacks simply because of the difference in our skin tone. We know that Native Americans, those who inhabited the United States long before anyone settled there, were denied citizenship in the United States until 1924. We often like to believe that post Trail of Tears we came to our senses, but no. It took until 1924 to grant them citizenship, and until the 1960s, 1968, before the Bill of Rights was actually applied to the Native American population, and they still do not enjoy every facet of the Bill of Rights. Identity politics became law in the United States in 1882 through the, um, through the Chinese Exclusion Act, which followed the Page Act. The United States imported Chinese laborers to build the railroads, to build the West, but then decided that through the Page Act in 1875 to deny the right of Chinese laborers to bring their wives over. And because that wasn't quite as effective as they thought in 1882, they just said no more could come. It was the first anti-immigration law passed in the United States, and it continued for more than a century. We know that each time these laws pass, they were not passed in discriminative identity, they were passed because of identity. And therefore, we have to acknowledge the problem of identity politics, which is that we pretend that identity doesn't matter until it becomes inconvenient, until it starts to harm the majority population, or until it starts to unsettle what has become normative in our communities. The other challenge of identity politics is that it insists that the marginalized should not demand public acknowledgement of their grievances. We know that in the United States, recent conversations about Black Lives Matter has caused a great deal of backlash. The argument is that black lives should not have to have a hashtag or a demand for movement because they shouldn't be separate from the rest of the lives. In fact, those who are the most dismissive retort to Black Lives Matter by saying all lives matter. Well, yes, we would like to believe that all lives matter, but black lives are most in danger. And this notion that the public acknowledgement of that grievance is somehow erosive and corrosive to our body politic is nonsense. We cannot be a United States if people within our country do not feel safe. If they feel compelled to articulate that their specific identity it bears a threat to their existence. We know that current demographic and social trends are expediently moving, that technological advances are making identity even more obvious and more easily shared. And because of that, embracing diversity has to be the way we approach things, because this false notion of uniformity ignores daily experience. And those who deride identity politics, they depend on a number of misjudgments. Uh, Francis Fukuyama, for example, argues that economics, more than race or gender or other marginalizations, should carry the day. But it ignores that race and class have always been intrinsically linked, whether in the United States or abroad, 
Because when you fight for class but ignore the racial constrictions or the gender constrictions or the fact that in the United States you can be fired from your job from being a member of the LGBTQ community, then you cannot divorce class and economics from marginalized communities. We have to recognize that there are wide substrates of inequality and those substrates have to be acknowledged if they are going to be addressed. But why is this a problem? It's a problem because identity politics have been seized upon as a way to hold the marginalized accountable for daring to express their grievance. We are blaming the victims for acknowledging that they are victims and saying, please stop making me a victim. And we do that by saying that their seeking redress for their oppression is somehow offensive to the rest of us. But the reality is that as we change, as we become a more democratic and diverse society, we are they. And acknowledging that we are they is not harmful to us. In fact, it is how democracies become more vibrant, more inclusive, and more resilient.